This is part five of our exegesis of the story of the rich young ruler. And we're going to wrap this one up today. The story starts with Jesus praying over children. And then he explains to his disciples, his students, how the kingdom of God is made up of childlike people. Entry into the kingdom is dependent on a person being childlike. Then as kind of an object lesson, Jesus tells the rich young ruler to become childlike by selling everything that he has in following Jesus. You know, a child's dependent on the parent to guide their lives. But this guy wasn't willing to give up control of his life to Jesus. He wasn't willing to become childlike. And then Jesus started explaining a principle of life how riches and wealth make it hard for somebody to decide to serve God. You know, when we get saved, whether we realize it or not, that process of being born from above is really a slave auction. God buys us, just like a master of old would buy a slave. That purchase is for us and for everything we own, everything we control, and at that instant, Everything about us belongs to God without condition. Unfortunately, we often struggle against becoming a bondservant of the Most High God. We imagine in our fleshly mind that we still own at least some of our stuff. We imagine falsely that we still control at least a part of our lives. When the truth is, when you said, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart and be Lord of my life, at that instant, whether or not you realized it, you gave up everything to serve God. So this is where we pick up the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus tells this guy to give up everything, and he refuses to do it. Now the disciples overhear this conversation, and they start feeling pretty good about themselves. Hey, look at us, Lord. We gave up everything. Well, they hadn't really given up everything, but they had surrendered their lives to Jesus. They were following him. They did whatever he told them to do. That's how a bondservant lives, giving up all to their master. But this is the cool part of how God works. He tells us to give up everything, and then he gives back to us more than we gave up. Jesus doesn't use the term bondservant, but that's what he described. Most of the New Testament writers actually used that term bondservant at the time to refer to themselves. Early Christians knew that they were bondservants of Jesus. And that brings us to this point in the teaching about the structure of the kingdom of God, how it's not like earthly structures. This is where, in the story... Jesus explains the ROI of coming into the kingdom of God. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Mark 10, verses 28 through 30. Peter said, hey, behold, we've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or mothers or sisters or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, he'll receive eternal life. So this idea of return on what you give to the Lord, hmm, let me show you what I think this really means, okay? Turn to Matthew 19 and 29. Matthew 19 and 29. This is just another version of that same story. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or children or farms for my sake will receive many times as much. That's like a lot more than what you had, right? Go back to Mark 10:30, though. He actually puts a number on this. He says that whoever's left everything will receive back everything a hundred times. What? A hundred times what you gave up? Now, Debbie and I have bought and sold a few houses over the years. We've always sold whatever house we bought. We've sold it for more than we paid for it. 
A couple of times, the sale of the house approached three times what we had paid for the house. If I could promise you a three-time return on your investment over a few years, I mean, people would be knocking my door down to get that. But Jesus promised a 100-fold return. Now, let me explain what that means. Let's say that your net worth right now is $100,000. Net worth is what you'd get if you sold, liquidated everything that you owned. And let's say that I told you that if you will give me that $100,000, then over the remainder of your life, I'm going to give back to you $10 million. That's a 100-fold return. Would you take that offer? My boy, I would. Well, that's Jesus' offer to those that leave everything for him. If this rich young you ruler had just hung around for about five more minutes, he would have heard Jesus explain this. And as a rich businessman, I'm sure that he would have changed his decision. You know, hmm, let's see, if I sell everything I have and give the proceeds to the poor, then he's going to give back to me over the rest of my life 100 times all of the stuff that I sold. Hmm. And then at the end of this, I still get to go to heaven? Wow, I'm taking that deal. Where do I sign up? But he didn't hang around long enough to hear the rest of the bargain. He was too controlled by his wealth, his power, his stuff. Look at the end of verse 30 there. After promising all this return for serving him a hundred times, Jesus says, and you'll get eternal life. That's the second part of Jesus' promise to those that give up everything to follow him. And that, my friends, is far more valuable than a few years of luxury here on this planet. God's kingdom is just different from earthly kingdoms. Go back to Mark 10. Let's look at verse 31. Jesus says, after talking about the 100-fold return, he says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Look at what they talked about just a few days before this. Go back to Mark 9, 33 through 37. Mark 9, starting in verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. So what were you guys talking about on the way? Well, they kept silent because on the way they had discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last, and then he will be servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before him, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. Whoever receives me doesn't receive me, but receives him who sent me. The most important in the kingdom of God are the servants of all the others. And again, Jesus points out that the kingdom of God is totally different from what they're used to because the most successful ones in the kingdom of God are the most childlike. To me, one of the clearest contrasts between a godly view of the kingdom and our normal view of kingdom structures here on this earth is in titles. We humans get so caught up with titles, and we use those titles to elevate one above the other. We want to show who's more important and who's worthy of more respect or more fear or whatever. But using titles, by doing that, we often distort the true relationship between people. Did you know that Jesus taught about human titles? Turn to Mark 10, 17 through 18. Mark 10, 17 through 18. As he was setting out for a journey, a young man ran up to him. We've read this before, right? And he knelt down before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus says, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. Jesus asked this young guy, Why do you call me good? Well, this young man gave Jesus a title that Jesus didn't want. Good. Jesus didn't want this title for three reasons, I think. First of all, Jesus didn't like the use of titles at all. And we're going to see that in a minute. 
He didn't even want to be called teacher or master, which brings us back to the structure of the kingdom of God as a kingdom of equals. And we'll expand on that idea in a minute. Second, good was a term to refer to the religious leaders of the day. Good was a Pharisee code word for them as compared to everyone else, and Jesus took umbrage at that veiled reference. The rich young ruler thought he was doing a good thing by putting Jesus in the same category as the Jewish leaders. This man thought that Jesus' kingdom was like the one he already understood, where the leaders are better than the ones being led. But that's not how it is. Well, anyway, the last, I think, reason that Jesus didn't want to be called good, he didn't want to be compared to God, Yahweh, is because Jesus was a man. He was fully human. He didn't want any implication that he was different from any other human. He didn't want divine attributions because of the signs and wonders that he performed. Those signs and wonders came from God through the Holy Spirit. Those signs and wonders happened because Jesus was spirit-filled, not because Jesus was God on earth. Let's look at how Jesus taught about titles, okay? Go to Matthew 23, 8 through 11. Matthew 23, 8 through 11. But do not be called rabbi. By the way, if I was a Jew, I'd probably say rabbi. But I'm going to pronounce it the way, what we're used to. Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. That's equal. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ, or the anointed one. The greatest among you shall be the servant of all. So call no man rabbi or master or mister or teacher or father. Rabbi, there in verse 8, like I said, pronounced rabbi, is the term used for ordained clergy and political leaders of the Jews. It's a Jewish scholar or teacher who's been ordained that it was a title of honor, it was someone who is to be respected. The word teacher there where he says there's only one teacher, that really is just the word for instructor. Okay, And matter of fact, this is how the religious leaders of the day referred to Jesus. We see it all through the Gospels. Let me show you one example. Matthew 22, 24. Go back one chapter, Matthew 22, verse 24. Uh, Sadducee is talking to Jesus and says, teacher, Moses said, and then he goes on to talk about what Mo he thinks Moses had mentioned, and you'll notice there that this guy calls Jesus teacher. Well, teacher is the title that they used for Jesus. They didn't call him rabbi or master. Unfortunately, the King James Version often translates this word for teacher as master, but it really just means teacher. Now, Jesus said, don't let anyone call you teacher. Huh? Why not call someone rabbi or teacher? Well, look at the end of verse 8 there in Matthew 23. Go back to Matthew 23. Verse 8, the very end says, For you are all brothers. Literally there, you are all from the same womb. That means you're equals on the most fundamental of levels. And look at verse 9. That word father there is nothing special. It's just potter or father, dad. Uh, teacher in verse 10 now is a little bit different than the other teacher. That word means like a master teacher or a guru. Uh, master in the sense of one who mentors apprentices, not in the sense of a master over a slave. Where he says, call no man on earth father. What is Jesus talking about? So father is off limits, but daddy is okay? Well, that'd be silly. Of course I can call my earthly father, father or dad or daddy. I can call my bishop, who is my spiritual father. I can call him father. He's the father of my extended family in the church. I can call him father as it speaks to my relationship in the spirit. What I can't do is call him father, and listen to this, because this is the key to this. I can't call him father in such a way that elevates him over 
anyone else. We're all humans. We're all brothers and sisters, the same level of importance. Let's look at the full text here of Matthew 23, 1 through 12, okay? Starting in verse 1, Jesus speaking to the crowd and his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves on the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do it and observe it. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say the things and then don't do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with even so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels on their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. They love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all from the same womb, brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Don't be called leaders, for one who is a leader, that is the anointed one. But the greatest among you shall be servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Jesus is really teaching against the worldly view of leadership. The worldly view of leadership is all about authority and how the leader can exercise that authority over their subjects. The godly view of leadership comes from family and shepherding. How can the leader serve those being led? How can the leader fulfill their responsibility to guide, to guard, to govern the ones being led? The Pharisees illustrated for Jesus the ultimate bad leadership pattern. Look at verse 2. It says, they sit in a position of ultimate authority. That's the Moses seat. And uh, he told people, yeah, do what they tell you to do, but (laughs) don't do as they do because they never help or equip those who are under them. They don't ever help them fulfill their purpose. I think there are two things going on here. First of all, Jesus is talking about honorifics titles. He's not talking about assignments or functions. Okay, and it's a key difference. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrators, various kinds of tongues. What? He's using titles. No, he's talking about assignments in the church structure. That includes apostles, teachers, administrators. Obviously, the early church fathers didn't think they were violating Jesus' teaching here by calling people teacher or apostle or evangelist or whatever. Jesus seems to say, don't use those titles, but that's exactly what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Was Paul being disobedient? No, because what Paul was doing was he was recognizing the different people have different assignments and different functions. If someone has the assignment of teacher, I can certainly refer to them as teacher, their job. What I can't do is call them teacher in such a way that implies that as a teacher, they are somehow better or more spiritual than those around them or more important. See the difference? It's the difference between using a title to acknowledge someone's assignment and using a title as an honorific that implies that that person is somehow better or more important than other people. The other thing I think that explains how Jesus was talking here about titles is that Jesus was using a literary tool. It's called hyperbole. That's where you exaggerate figures of speech so that you can really make the point. And he's trying to make the point that all humans are equal and that no one is better or higher than any other and that leaders are not in the position of leadership to serve themselves They're not in the position of leadership to dominate others. They're in the position of leadership to serve. Go back to Matthew 23 real quick. Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12. 
But the greatest among you shall be your servants. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So is Jesus saying it's not permissible to use titles to convey office or function? Uh, No, I don't think so. He said it's okay to differentiate office or function with a title, but it's not okay to let your title go to your head. (laughs) It's not okay for you to forget that your title is just indicates your office or function of service. It's not a position of dominance over others like the Pharisees did. You call me Father Dan for the same reason that you call your biological father daddy or dad or father. To say that you respect me as the one responsible spiritually for this household, this parish, this group of Christians, not because I somehow take the place of our Heavenly Father or even take the place of your earthly father. And you should never call me Father, implying that I'm somehow better than anybody else. Well, let's connect what Jesus said there in Matthew 23, 11, 12, back to Mark 10, 31, okay? Matthew 23, 11, and 12, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever is humbled will be exalted. Then we go back to Mark 10, 31, where Jesus says, But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus was trying to help his students understand how different is the kingdom of God. The first shall be last. The ones with the highest office will be last and servants of all the rest. Let me give you an example from my life. My boss, Archbishop Chuck Jones, has the title Archbishop. That title tells everyone that he has lots of authority to make all kinds of spiritual decisions for the church. To Archbishop Chuck, that title reminds him not of his authority, but it reminds him that he is the servant of everybody in the archdiocese. It reminds him that he has responsibility for everyone in the archdiocese. I call him Bishop Chuck because among humans, I must honor the accepted way of doing things. But I'd rather call him Father because that really better describes how he is my spiritual father in the Lord here on this earth. Sometimes I'd rather call him Brother because he is indeed a brother in the Lord. But if I call him Brother in public, I'd be accused by others of disrespecting his office. However, I happen to know that Bishop Chuck would accept brother without issue, if I called him that, because he knows that he's just one of the brothers and sisters in Jesus. Bishop Chuck has an assignment that organizationally puts him over most others. But he knows that he, Chuck Jones, the person in Jesus, is just one of the bondservants, no more or less important to Jesus than anyone else. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. God's kingdom is different from earthly kingdoms and organizations. I want to go back to something for a minute. I want to end this lesson on the rich young ruler with kind of an overall thought of what I've learned from this study. Let's go back to the idea of being an emptied out bond servant to the king. Now that we've finished the story of the rich young ruler, I want to reflect back on what I think is one of the key takeaways from this story. Jesus asks this young man to give up everything and follow him. Jesus really calls all of us to give up everything and follow him. It's just that we do that kind of in the middle of ongoing life. You know, for most of us, that means we don't sell everything. We just make a kind of a mental shift in our thinking and recognize that Jesus now owns it all. It's all his stuff now, not ours. But at least that should be <laughs> the way we look at life in Jesus. I, I'm not sure that we do. In light of all this, let me encourage you to do two things, okay? And the first thing is re-examine your life. I ask you to examine yourself to see what you're holding back from surrendering to God. 
I've been serving God for 66 years, and I have to tell you that when I was preparing this part of the teaching, the Lord really challenged me. He reminded me of things that for years I'd said I'd like to do that someday. And he reminded me of that, and then he asked me the question, how important is that? Some things that I've dreamed of doing or having, you know, if I just had enough money or time, I'd do that. And when I thought of those things, the Lord said, how important is that? What the Lord was really asking on these things was, is that dream or goal something that the Lord put there? Or is that just something that's come from my human spirit? Some of you know what a pack rat that I can be, you know, holding on to things because someday I might build something with that or use it uh, for something. You know, listen, I went through a lot of my junk during the last couple of weeks preparing this lesson and I threw away or burned a bunch of stuff, stuff that I had been dreaming about doing someday. I got rid of it. I said, I want to concentrate on what the Lord has for me today. I'm trying to understand what it means to be a bondservant. But it's just so extreme, so different from what we normally think. I am fully owned by God, and yet He delights in pouring out His many graces on me so I can enjoy them. He delights in watching me enjoy life, but my life is not my own. It belongs to Him. Whatever I give up, He'll return to me a hundred times. It's all his, but he's giving me a return on what he already paid for? See what I mean? It's hard to reconcile all this and fit it all together, fit all these conflicting notions together. Anyhow, thinking about giving up everything to the Lord has really gotten me doing some soul searching. And I suspect this soul searching is going to continue for a while. What's my point here? Examine your life to make sure that you really are giving up everything to God. Not just something, but everything. Every relationship, every dream, every plan. Give it to Him as you would give a gift to someone. Let it go. Sell all you have and give it up. That's what Jesus told the rich young ruler. Okay, the second thing I hope this inspires you to do is to luxuriate in God's wealth. His wealth is not about necessarily uh, satisfying every appetite that we have. His wealth is about making sure all of our needs are met. And He will send you through times of testing to make sure that you've learned this well. Don't get discouraged. He's perfecting our view of the world and our life. God's wealth is that we are here for each other. Rest in that. Revel in that support and peace of others around you. This is what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, don't worry about the cares of this life. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. We're not going to read that right now, but he talks about all these things that will get added to you if you'll just put first the kingdom of God. Revel in that. Enjoy that. Let God provide every need for you as a grace, as a free gift. Relax in His lavish provision for you, His bondservant. Find ways to enjoy the extended family of Christians that He's given you. Thank Him every day for His blessings of His kingdom so that He can then pour out on you even more blessings. Well, what's the conclusion to these thoughts? We are bought and paid for slaves who own nothing of our own. But we're provided for by our master in such a lavish way that we have to occasionally pinch ourselves and remember that we are indeed just bondservants and nothing else. 